Uh, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stacy Duncan, President and CEO of the Greater Binghamton Chamber of Commerce and Executive Director of the agency or the Broome County IDA. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, Lunch and Learn style webinar, uh, I think on a very important program to our small business community, uh, a webinar to educate you on the New York State COVID-19 Pandemic Small Business Recovery Grant Program. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Matthew Kennedy with Empire State Development, who I will be uh, turning the floor over to in just a moment. Um, and as well, we're recording this, so we'll make this available to watch uh, following today's uh, live webinar. Uh, the New York State uh, Small Business Recovery Grant Program was created to provide flexible grant assistance to currently viable small businesses, micro businesses, and for-profit independent arts and cultural organizations in New York State who have experienced economic hardship due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know that while we are um, finally in a state of putting a lot of this um, behind us and, and sort of returning to normal lives as, as you will, uh, we know that our small business community especially was hit tremendously hard by COVID. Um, and the economic impact will, will last for some time. Um, as such, we have a number of resources available on the Chamber's website. We have a, a business resiliency toolkit that has a lot of information about financial resources. Uh, this will be added to that document and as well a reopening playbook where we're trying to keep our business community up to date on all of the changing guidelines um, as, as we go. Um, and so with that, I just want to uh, thank, thank again, uh, Matthew Kennedy with Empire State Development. He's going to walk us through the program, uh, the application process, the guidelines. And I think with a smaller group, if you have questions as you go, please feel free to put them in the chat. And I think we'll have some time for some dialogue with Matthew. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, again, yes. Again, my name is Matthew Kennedy. I'm from Empire State Development's Division for Small Business and Technology Development. I am uh, part of the Access to Capital team that works on uh, various loan programs uh, for small businesses around the state, including this recovery grant program, along with uh, programs like the New York Forward Loan Fund. So uh, today we're going to talk specifically about the, the COVID-19 pandemic small business recovery grant program. And what I'm using here as a basis for this presentation is a program and application guide that is available in 13 different languages on our website uh, for the program. So if you want to refer to this information, you can always refer to this information directly off the website. There's always going to be a brand new version of it or the most current version of it on the site. And it is translated into 13 languages if uh, you have the need to use it in a different language. So one of the things I will do is in order to, to help with the presentation, I'm gonna pause my camera because it does seem like a lot of times um, there might be some audio problems if I don't. So I wanna make sure that everyone can hear my voice. So I'm gonna pause my camera and I'll unpause it at the end of the presentation. So let me begin. So again, as a program overview, uh, the New York, the New York State COVID-19 Pandemic Small Business Recovery Grant Program is a flexible grant program specifically for for-profit uh, small businesses, micro-businesses, and for-profit independent arts and cultural organizations in New York State. Um, they do have to be currently viable and open. Uh, the website where you can apply for this program and receive more information about it or to view this particular document is www.nysmallbusinessrecovery, all one word. Dot com. So it's nysmallbusinessrecovery.com. I do want to point out that we have partnered with an organization called Lendistry. Uh, Lendistry is a national CDFI that has a particular expertise in setting up websites and doing things electronically. And uh, they have actually worked on other programs like this in California and Pennsylvania. So they have the ability to, to handle large scale programs like this. So we have partnered with them uh, to help get these grants out and to help get the grants out as fast as possible. So if you do apply for a grant and you receive emails or you receive contact from an organization called Lendistry, they're actually working on behalf of Empire State Development. They're a part of our team to get these grants off the ground and in people's hands. So now for grant amounts, a lot of people wanna know how much a grant they're gonna qualify for. So your grant award is based on your business's annual gross receipts for the year 2019. So it's based upon the actual amounts recorded on your tax returns. And for a small business with the annual gross receipts between $25,000 and $50,000 a year, $49,999, 
that's going to be a five thousand dollar flat grant for businesses between the 50 and a hundred thousand dollars a year that's going to be a ten thousand dollar flat grant and for businesses between a hundred and five hundred thousand dollars a year it is 10 percent of those gross receipts so it's 10 percent of the gross receipts is recorded on the on the tax return up to a maximum of fifty thousand dollars so if you had three hundred thousand dollars in gross receipts on your tax return for 2019 then you can qualify for a thirty thousand dollar grant and i'll talk a little bit more about how grants are calculated and, and where you'll find that information on your tax return but before i go too far i do want to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as some of the terms i'm using so a small business in this case is a small business which is a business which is incorporated in and licensed and registered to do business in new york state that is independently owned and operated and has fewer than 100 employees so 100 or fewer employees when i say micro business well that's actually also going to be a small business that's uh, licensed and registered in the state of new york incorporated in the state of new york but it would have fewer than 10 employees a for-profit independent arts and cultural organization is also going to be a small business, uh, but it can have up to 100 employees, excluding their seasonal employees. So seasonal employees don't count into the calculation for the number of employees for the size of the business. And those businesses are going to be engaged in fields like architecture, dance, film, uh, music, theater, opera, media, uh, museums, visual arts, folk arts, and so forth. And finally, the COVID-19 health and safety protocols, when I mentioned that, uh, those are all the restrictions that were put in place based upon Executive Order 202 that was issued by the governor um, when the pandemic began and when we were, uh, were operating under restrictions. So small businesses, micro businesses, and for-profit independent arts and cultural organizations uh, do need to be currently viable. So they need to be currently in operation. They need to have begun operation on or before March 1st, 2019 to be qualified for the grant. So essentially it is a year prior to COVID, the business needed to be in existence uh, for it to qualify for a grant. And eligible applicants are going to be required to show a loss of gross receipts as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic for, for, uh, for compliance for the program. And of course, you had to be in compliance with your health and safety protocols back when they were in place. So now, what size business qualifies? How big can your business be? So a small business, micro business, or a for-profit independent arts and cultural organization should have on their 2019 or 2020 tax returns, gross receipts between $25,000 and $500,000 per year. And that can be found on line 1A on form 1120, also 1120S, or uh, on the 1065, which is a partnership uh, tax return. That would be line one on your 1040 Schedule C. And if you happen to be a farm that uses a Schedule F, that's actually the sum of line 1A and line 2 on your Schedule F. I do want to point out at this moment that it is important to say that that's 2019 or 2020 tax returns. So if you were a small business that had in 2019, let's say a million dollars in gross receipts, you were above the, five, the $500,000 threshold. However, in 2020, you only had $300,000 in gross receipts. So you'd seen a 70% loss in gross receipts. Because you had seen the loss and you were under the $500,000 threshold for 2020, you could qualify, you could apply for a grant. So in this particular case, the maximum grant you would get would be $50,000, be a $50,000 grant because it's the maximum size based on your 2019 gross receipts, but it is still possible for you to qualify. If your 2019 gross receipts were outside of these thresholds, but your 2020s were inside these thresholds. And the opposite of that's also true. If you had a business with, let's say, $50,000 in gross receipts in 2019, and now in 2020, you only had $5,000 in gross receipts, even though your business is smaller than the gross receipts minimum, it could still qualify because you had the gross receipts that were that qualified in 2019. So for the second requirement, we do have, to, you have to, do have to demonstrate that you had positive net profit in 2019 on your business tax return. One of the markers we're using for viability is that a for-profit business was profitable, at least by a dollar, in the year 2019. So it is a, a $1 or greater, it has to be found on your tax return as the profit for 2019. And it gets going to use line 28 on your 1120, line 22 on your 1065, and line 31 or 34 on your 1040 Schedule C or Schedule F. 
uh, that is one of the requirements, along with demonstrating that it, your business had at least a 25% loss in gross annual receipts in a year to year comparison from 2019 to 2020. Now, the way this is working is it does work off your 2019 and your 2020 tax returns. So it is as it appears on your 2019 return on your 2020 return. And essentially what happens is that we take your 2019 return, take the value, take the value from your 2020 return, subtract it from your 2019 return, and that's your percentage loss. And it doesn't make any difference um, what, your, what your fiscal year is, what your tax year is. It's, on, it's based upon those two returns, your 2019 to 2020 tax returns. Um, and finally, uh, this is an important thing to point out. You do need to be able to demonstrate that your total expenses on your 2020 business income tax return are greater than the grant amount. So for example, let's say that uh, you were going to qualify for a $20,000 grant for the program. You need to be able to show on your expenses, on your tax return, that there was at least $20,000 in actual expenses. Now, it would be unusual for a business to have gross receipts that would be so high compared to their expenses. Um, $20,000 would be $200,000 in gross receipts. And if you couldn't show ten or $20,000 in, in expenses, well, that would be less than 10% of your gross receipts would be go, going to expenses, which is a very unusual thing to happen, but it is possible. So I do want to point that out. The um, Most businesses are not going to encounter that for obvious reasons, because a typical small business is probably going to run, as far as expenses to gross receipts, 65, 66, 68%. That seems to be about the average. So it's going to be unusual for that to happen, but it is possible. So I want to make sure that that's pointed out. A couple other important things to know. Of course, you do have to be in substantial compliance with federal, state, and local laws. Uh, you can't owe any taxes prior to July 15th, 2020, unless they've been covered by an approved repayment plan. So if you do have taxes that are in arrears, that were due prior to July 15th, 2020, you can still qualify for the grant, provided you have a, a repayment plan or a deferral plan in place. And, uh, you know, you, you will need documentation of that. You'll just have to show that you've got that plan in place, that you're following it, and that's acceptable. Also, there are some questions with compatibility as to how this is going to work with federal programs, because you uh, cannot have been able to obtain sufficient business assistance from federal programs beyond this program. So there are a couple of guidelines that are important to point out here. First of all, to qualify for this loan, this is, or this grant, I should say, you cannot have received a Paycheck Protection Program loan of more than $100,000. So there's $100,000 maximum the amount that you, can that you can have received from the Paycheck Protection Program to qualify for this grant. That is a sum across both rounds. So if you receive 60000 in one round and 60000 in the second round, that's going to be $120,000. You won't be able to apply for this. But it is $100,000 maximum amount you're allowed to receive. Part of that's because it's convertible into a grant. Um, so it is $100,000 $100, maximum on the Paycheck Protection Program. Now for the EIDL, grant, for the EIDL loan program, you could have received an EIDL advanced grant of up to $10,000, a supplemental targeted advanced grant of up to $5,000. And any size idle loan, idle loans are not part of the equation. We're not concerned if we received other loans. We're more concerned about if we received other grants. For the idle program, that really should be the maximum size grants you would have received. So really everyone for idle should qualify. That shouldn't be an issue. Uh, there could be somebody out there that, does, that, that would be uh, not compliant with that, but I, I don't believe so. And finally, the SBA Shuttered Venue Operator Grant is allowed. So there are, and there is no limitation on the amount you could have received for that. So if you did receive a, sh a Shuttered Venue Operator Grant, if you're lucky enough to get one or, or we're in an in a industry category that could qualify for one, yes, you can receive one and still qualify for this grant. Matthew, yes. um, this is Amy Shaw from the Chamber. We actually do have um, a question in, in the chat uh, related to qualifying and showing uh, receipts and loss of uh, revenue. Alan, if you want to just unmute yourself and maybe ask Matthew the question directly, that would be great. Oh, sure. Okay. I just did. Uh, yeah, I just was curious because you're using 2019 and 2020 tax return and I just have a client that's a fiscal year tax return. So their actual 
2019 tax return is the uh, fiscal year ending October 31st, 2020. Um, the actual form is a 2019 tax form because it's the beginning of the tax year was in 2019. Uh, so I wasn't sure how you calculate it. So their 2020 fiscal year return uh, would be, uh, you know, not over yet. It would be October 31st, 2021. So I guess if you go by the end of the fiscal year, you, maybe you could use October 31st, 19 versus October 31st, 20. Actually, it is what appears on their tax returns. We do have to have two filed tax returns for 2019 and 2020. Okay. So in this particular case, they won't, if they haven't filed a 2020 tax return, they can't qualify. Yeah. They do have to have a 20, uh, the, the 2020 tax return has to be filed. There's no, there's no exceptions or way around that particular requirement. Yeah. So that kind of so, kicks out a, fis a fiscal year company like this, in this example for October 31st, they won't file their 2020 tax return until like. But I am under the impression that there is still a tax return that needed to be filed by April 15th or by the deadline anyway. Correct. That was, according to the IRS rules, there should have been a tax return. There should have been something that should have been filed prior to the deadline. For well, the, their year deadline. 20. Yeah, they don't have, they don't have an October, they don't have a um, April 15th deadline. It's a corporation which files uh, three and a half months after the end of the fiscal year. So right. And that was the, what we were, what we had researched was that the IRS states that there was still supposed to be something filed even if you're not filing inside that tax, if you've got a different fiscal year, there's still another document that you filed for 2020 of some sort. This is, this is what we've been told by the IRS. But in, in either regard, we have to have a 2020 tax return. So if there's no 2020 tax return, there's no other way around it. We have to have a completed 2020 tax return and a completed 2019 tax return. Yeah, because the fiscal year corporations use the tax year on the form is the beginning of the tax year, not the end of the tax year. Yeah. And, and, so and, their, their October 31st, 20, which has 10 months of 2020 activity on it, is actually filed on a 2019 tax return, and that's been filed already. But uh, their 2020 form tax return, which would be will be their fiscal year ending October 31st, 2021, which hasn't ended yet. So they can't file a return until that's until after October 31st, 21. Yeah, it does need to be 2019 and 2020. Okay. All right. So they're kind of out, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I, 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 you know, sometimes, you know, by, by, I, you know, in this particular case, by doing their taxes that way, by doing it based on those fiscal years, that yeah. just creates a problem with this program. You know, sometimes that's what happens. I mean, what can, what, the, the, unfortunately, in order to keep it balanced, you know, that's the way it's being done for all businesses. So, so there's only one consistent, it's the same, the same time period is being used for every business, same month, this month to that month time period is being used for every business to keep it balanced and to keep it fair. So it's, so it's set objectively as opposed, as opposed to subjectively based upon whatever the business's financial year was. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the IRS is saying to you, but there, there would be no other form this, this company would file. For 2020 i mean there's nothing by yeah, April. I, I i i am not i was not privy to the conversation with the irs but this is what <laughs> this is what we were told okay by i you know that doesn't come that doesn't come out of the sky that is something oh, yeah, that yeah. i was told by high, higher high very high up in the organization that this was something that they had already discussed so interesting okay i don't know <laughs> great well thank you so much matthew for taking the sure. time to answer that and and feel free to continue putting questions in the chat and we'll get, get to those throughout the program. Okay. So let's see, where was I? So, okay, so eligible applicants uh, must provide evidence acceptable to New York State that they're operational, they're not restricted by any mandates. That, if an example of that would be that if you were, let's say a, a bar and you had a liquor license, your liquor license needs to be intact. It can't be currently revoked. Um, Due to the limited amount of funding and the high volume of, of requests expected, your business type, geography, or industry may factor into your ability to receive a grant. Uh, there's there's the possibility that if there are too many applications in one part of the state versus another part of the state, say downstate versus upstate, they have to reallocate the funds from one area to another to make sure that it's it's been it's fair. Um, and also, priority is going to be given to socially and economically disadvantaged business owners, including but not limited to 
minority woman-owned business enterprises. They do not need to be New York State certified. Service disabled veteran-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses and businesses located in communities that are economically economically distressed prior to March 1st, 2020, as determined by most recent census data. That essentially means that we're going to be trying to process those applications first. I do want to point out that the way these applications are being processed, it is not really a first come first serve program because applications are being processed in batches. So what's going to happen is that as one batch of applications comes in, they're all going to be evaluated together. They may um, be when they're being processed, they may be processed by region, they may be processed by geography in order to make things easier for, for Lendistry. However, uh, so it's not truly first come first serve because it's going to be going around in stages around the, around the state and around different uh, industries and so forth. So um, what will happen is after you've applied, you will get a notification in your email um, that your application has been selected to continue on with processing, or it may come by a text message. I'll talk about that in a moment when we get deeper into the application process. So I do want to point out ineligible businesses. There are some app, uh, some businesses that are not eligible for these grants under any circumstances. Um, nonprofits, churches, other religious institutions, they are not eligible. Government-owned entities and elected official offices, they're not eligible. Uh, businesses primarily engaged in political lobbying activities are not eligible. Now, this is an important one here. Businesses that received awards from the SBA Restaurant Revitalization Grant Program. So if you were lucky enough to actually get money from the, near, from the uh, SBA Restaurant Revitalization Fund, uh, if you were lucky enough to get selected, you know, those could be very generous grants. They were designed really to make up all the lost revenue for the business. Uh, if you did receive one of those, you cannot qualify for the New York State grant. You can't receive both of them. The expectation would be that if you got the New York State grant and then ultimately were selected for the other program, you would take the other program because it's probably a, a larger grant and return the New York State grant. Uh, also, landlords and passive real estate income businesses are not eligible because there are other programs with other agencies that are qualifying or that are being covered for those types of businesses. And of course, illegal businesses and enterprises are not eligible. So an illegal business, of course, can't receive a grant. So now for documentation, this is the documentation that's being collected. Uh, this is the documentation that is required to show that you qualify for the grant. So we do need Again, for gross receipts loss, we do need full 2019 and 2020 business income tax returns as filed. So we need to have both returns complete with all schedules. Uh, for corporations and LLCs, those are going to be a, ver a variation of Form 1120. For partnerships, it's going to be your 1065. For sole proprietors, it'll either be your 1040 with your Schedule C or your 1040 with your Schedule F, depending on your sole proprietorship and your type of business. But again, they do need to be the full filed tax returns for 2019 and 2020 with all the all the attachments, all the schedules. Also, uh, we have the option of collecting an IRS form 4506C. Now, this is only if it's going to be requested if for some reason there's a, a problem with reviewing your tax transcript or you're reviewing your taxes as submitted. This al allows us to request verification from the IRS on the tax on your tax documents. If this form is required, what will happen is the lender is going to reach out to you and provide you with a form to sign and return. Uh, the 4506 C has several lines on it that have to be completed beforehand uh, that allow the documents or the, the information to go towards the, whatever organization needs them. And you're not supposed to sign a blank document with blank with blank spaces. It's not dangerous to do that. So Lendistry is going to provide you with a form that's already completed, that has all your business's information on it prior to you signing the document and uploading it into the website. Also, we're going to need proof of your location and your current operation. So to show that you're where you're located, you're located in the state and that you're currently operating, we are looking for two different documents, any two of the following list, a current lease, a utility bill, a business bank statement, a business mortgage statement, business credit card statement, um, a professional insurance bill, a payment processing statement. This would be if you uh, collect, say, credit card payments from like a Square or any, any sort of other organization that, that processes credit card payments for your business, you can use that. Or your New York State ST-809 or ST-100 sales tax collection documentation. So this is your documentation that shows you're currently collecting sales tax in the state of New York. And that, of course, is going to show the most recent document is going to show that you're currently operating. 
Also, we'll be collecting a schedule of ownership, which is essentially is a listing of names, addresses, and social security numbers. Or if it was a non-US owner, it would be an ITIN number, um, a phone number, email address, and your percentage ownership, along with a photo ID for each of those individuals with 20% or more ownership of the business. Now, for the application, we only request that one person fill one out. Please only complete one application per business. And whoever is the applicant who's going to be responsible for collecting up this information and uploading it into the site, uh, they should include their photo ID. So that's one of the requirements that use their photo ID of their information. If there are other owners that with at least 20% ownership interest, if it's not just a single owner, what will happen is prior to funding, there's another document that you'll upload with that person's information with, or that person's information along with their identification. Now for proof of the number of employees your business has, we're looking for your most recently submitted New York State 45 document. That's only for employer firms. It's only if you have to file them. You may not have to file them if you don't have any employees um, or if you only have one employee yourself. This is if you do payroll, of course, this is your documentation to show that you're withholding money with the state of New York and that you're paying unemployment insurance. Uh, also, prior to funding, we're going to need proof of business organization. So we're going to need proof that it shows that you're organized to operate in the state of New York. Uh, we only need one of the following, but we do need your current business license, your current business, a current business certificate, a certificate of organization, a certificate of assumed name, which commonly we call the DBA, a New York State certificate of authority, articles of incorporation, or any other new New York State municipality issued document that shows authorization to operate in the state of New York. So it's a pretty broad list. Most people will have easy access to one of those documents. The, your, your New York State certificate of authority is typically uh, on view someplace in your business, typically at your cash register. So that will work. Um, articles of incorporation can be a little harder to find a lot of times, but any of those documents should, pro should provide adequate documentation that you are organized in the state of New York. And also for funds distribution, we're gonna need your IRS form W-9 and your bank account information. I'll talk about that briefly at the end of the presentation. Uh, that is collected through the website. There's a third party organization called PLAID that we use for ACH transfers that Lendistry has got a, a, a contract with to do ACH transfers for this program. So we've talked a lot about the grants. We haven't talked much about what you can use them for. So eligible uses of funds. How can you use this grant? How can you use these monies? What's the, what's the purpose of the money? So grants are to be used for COVID-19 related expenses that were incurred between March 1st, 2020 and April 1st, 2021. Now those dates of course are in the past. Those are expenses that were occurred during that year, during the pandemic. And so it's understood that these are expenses that have already been incurred. And what this money can do is to use to either reimburse the business for those costs or if the bills are still outstanding potentially pay those bills or if the costs have um, already been expended by the business say you had to put money into your business you had to take out a business loan to pay for these things you can use it to pay pay off pay your loan off to take the money back out of the business if necessary it essentially frees up the capital in the business that it used to cover these types of expenses so those expenses would be payroll costs, which includes all things related to payroll. Um, commercial rent or mortgage payments on your New York-based property or New York State-based property, that does include principal if it's a mortgage. Uh, principal is allowed, uh, but it can't be for prepayments. It needs to be payments that are inside those date thresholds, March 1st to April 1st. Uh, payment of your local property or school taxes that are associated with your small business are allowed. Insurance costs are allowed. Utility costs are allowed. Costs of personal protection equipment uh, for your workers, for your consumers, all allowed. Uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning costs. That includes not only the cost of actually heating and air conditioning, but also things like you needed to upgrade your filters for your air conditioning system. Those types of things are all qualified. Other machinery and equipment costs related to COVID-19 and operating during it. So let's say, for example, if you were a restaurant and you needed extra food water, food warmers for to-go orders, that would be a qualified equipment expense. Any sort of expenses that were like that to, to have your, allow your business to continue to operate during COVID, um, along with supplies and materials necessary for compliance with COVID-19 health and safety protocols. So that's going to be things like the Lexan and the plexiglass and the plywood and the rolled plastic and the stickers and all the things you had to put up for, for your social distancing. All those things are allowable expenses. 
two things that the grant can't be used for. It can't be used, the grant can't be used to directly pay down any SBA COVID-19 re relief package or any business assistance from a New York State um, loan package, like a New York Forward Loan Fund. So you can't use the funds to directly pay your New York Forward Loan Fund or your, uh, your say, your idle loan. Those aren't considered eligible expenses um, because those were loans that should have been taken out for other purposes or, or you know, towards other things. So those are not eligible to be paid directly. Of course, you can re reimburse yourself and then pay th pay other things with this loan, with this, these, these grant funds. So now the applicant certification. I do want to mention there are four documents. When you go to complete the application, there are four documents that you need to submit to begin the process. The applicant certification is one of them. Applicant certification is something you download off the website. It essentially is an attestation that all the things that we just talked about are true regarding your business, that you are currently in operation, that you are um, in compliance with federal, state, and local laws and regulations, codes, and so forth. Um, you have to go through with this particular document, initial the different sections, sign it, and re-upload it into the portal. You can either do that electronically, directly on the portal, or you can download it, sign it, and re-upload it. Like I said, this particular document is that I'm using as this basis is an application guide that's available on the website. So there are going to be some pages we start, with, start to go through here that are going to get very technical as far as where to click and how to download things and so forth. I'm going to kind of glance over those very quickly because that's really information that you'd be better off having in front of you when you're going to actually apply or having access to when you're applying as opposed to me trying to explain it to you now and then to have you try to remember it when you go to the website. However, these instructions are available again in this particular document on the website all the time. So again, like I said, you can download and sign or you can do it electronically, but that's the way that particular document is handled. Now, tips for applying for using our site. Again, we do suggest you, you do try to use Google Chrome if you have access to it. Other browsers may work, but the site is designed for Google Chrome, works best with Google Chrome. We do suggest you clear your cache before you, before you apply, just in case. Uh, we do suggest you open an incognito window, which makes sure that there's no, uh, there's no extra widgets that are attached to your Google Chrome that happen to be sniffing your data. And we also suggest you are going to need to disable your pop-up blocker because there are things, there are, are attestations that will pop up during the course of the application that are going to come up as pop-ups that you'll have to, you'll have to agree to. So, and again, this document has full instructions on how to do this, how to clear your cache, how to use incognito mode, how to disable your pop-up blocker if you're not familiar with how to do that in Chrome. We also ask you to submit your documents in PDF format when you upload them onto the site. And essentially just please make sure that they're legible. Uh, please look at the PDF before you upload it. Make sure that it's legible because uh, you know the document's going to need to be read by not only by people, but also by machines. They're going to need to be able to see that it's clear and going to be able to clearly read the information that's on the documents. Um, if you don't have access to a scanner, there are quite a few different things you can do, as, as, especially uh, with your smartphone. Uh, you can use your smartphone, the camera on your smartphone with software like Genius Scan or Adobe Scan, and you can use that uh, to, to image your documents, put them into PDFs, and upload them onto the site. You also ask to use a valid email address. Now this would seem to make sense, but um, please use some thought as to what email address you put in when you go to apply. One, you want it to be an email address you're gonna monitor. Two, you wanna make sure that it's not an email address that's gonna to be too public. Because what's gonna happen as part of the fraud mitigation system that's built into the website, it's gonna be looking for you know, different avenues of attack for applications and putting in false information. And of course, a program of this size is going to have that happen. Um, and what it's going to do is it's not going to want to send emails out to what would seem to be public mailboxes. So an info at your, your website, uh, sales at your website, support at your website, admin at your website. It's not going to want to send emails to those addresses. So I would suggest using either a personal email address, if that's the only type of website or email address you have access to that isn't one of those addresses for your website, or you could even use a free application like a, like a ProtonMail or a Yopmail to create a specific email address 
that's specific for your application. Just make sure that you monitor it. Watch the spam filter. Uh, watch to make watch for contacts because you will definitely receive emails from the website. Tip number seven: This application, along with all these guides, is available in multiple languages. You can translate the entire application using a drop down that's on the page uh, into other languages. Also, we have non English language support. Uh, available via the call center. So we have all these languages are supported by the call center as well. And that information again is on the small business recovery site. And now the application, we'll walk through this very quickly is to give you an idea as to what you're gonna be looking at, what information and how the application is gonna work. So the first thing that's gonna happen when you go to the small business recovery site, you're gonna go down to let's get started, click to begin your application, and it's going to bounce you quickly to a holding page. This essentially is going to throttle how uh, how many people are on the site at once, so that that way it doesn't become overwhelmed. And your site gets processed, your, your application gets processed correctly. Uh, if you've ever pre-ordered anything at Christmas time, any pre-ordered a toy like a PlayStation, you're probably familiar with it, with something like this. But what it's going to do is it's going to put you in a, in a holding pattern, and it's only going to take usually a few seconds. Uh, but the screen will come up to say that you're in line to start your application. Um, as soon as your application, the, the, the website has the, the ability for you to begin applying, it's going to put you through. Honestly, even at the very height of the application system, uh, the very beginning of the program, I never saw this number go more than about a minute. So you never had to wait very long. This might even f practically flash straight through uh, if you go to the site now. Then it's going to take you on to section one to start your application. So what information is needed? Very straightforward. Your name, your email address, your phone number, your business name, your, your zip code, your referral partner, if you're referred. Uh, so if you're referred by the agency, you want to put that in. Uh, and your preferred language. Also, um, there is a box to accept your SMS text policy, the SMS text policy from the site. Uh, the site can send you text messages on the status of your application, or if there's a document missing, or if it needs information, they can text you directly. Um, if you do select that, it's going to allow you to be texted. A pop-up will come up that you'll have to click OK. Um, if you don't select it, you can still continue on, but you won't be able to receive texts. So th th you don't have to accept it. You don't have to accept texts, but it is a good thing to do if you have access to it. Section two is going to ask for your owner details. This is essentially who is applying. Uh, this is uh, the person completing the application. Name, address, social security number, date of birth, percentage ownership. There will be a terms and conditions uh, selector at the bottom where you have to select the terms and conditions, hit OK. As soon as you hit save and agree, what's actually going to happen is on the back side of the system, it's going to generate a user account for you. It's going to generate a user account. It's going to go to your email address. Probably while you're still working on the application, this user account is going to appear in your email box. The nice thing about this is that that user account, if for some reason you would have to stop your application after this point, uh, you can always log back in with that user account to resume completing your application. So it does have that information stored prior to or after that point once that user account is generated. So now section three, business information. Again, also very straightforward. Your business name, your DBA if you use one, your business's EIN number, that's very important. Uh, your phone, business phone number, your business type, your state of incorporation, which should be New York, your business address, the start date for your business, that's when your business began, along with your business website if you have one. I do want to point out on the EIN line, you'll see all the way to the right, there is a little eye icon with a circle, uh, eye in a circle. That is an information icon. If you see that in any of these questions, if you hover your mouse over it, it will give you more information about the question. So if it gives you a, a sort of extra tips about it. Also, anytime, of course, anytime you see this little down carrot, that means that it's going to come from a drop down list. If you click on the carrot, it's going to give you a whole list of different choices to help you fill out that application or fill out that particular line of the document automatically. And now section four. How can we help? This is where you put in your gross receipts how much you think you are qualified for. Of course, your actual grant's gonna be wherever much you actually qualify for, not what you type in here, um, higher or lower. 
there is the check eligibility tab again, so you can go through and see the rules for eligibility. It's going to ask if your business was profitable in 2019. Of course, we're going to want that to be a yes for, for you to qualify uh, your number of employees. Um, if you did create any jobs in 2020 or if you've retained any of those employees, uh, you're going to be able to market there. The most important thing I want to like to point out here, the, the thing I want to point out in this particular slide, is you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen, there is a watch video button along from the across from how, how can we help you every section of the document every section of the application has a video attached to it that can help you complete the section it gives you tips on how to do it so it's a little video that will pop up you can watch the video as to where you get the information from also those videos are are subtitled in the 13 languages so if you turn on the closed captioning you can have them all be subtitled uh, by all the different languages if you need those videos in alternative languages so each section has one of those videos finally section five your business demographics this is going to ask for information about what your business does so are you business to business business are you business to consumer business are you a little bit of both what do you do do you sell products do you make products what type of industry are you in one thing it's going to ask is for your NAICS code it's going to ask for your NAICS code which of course is, is a, a federal code that dictates what industry your business is based in. They are self-assigned. NAICS code is a self-assigned code. So well, some businesses, especially if you're New York State certified, you probably are familiar with what your NAICS code is because you've needed that information to get certified. Uh, however, if you are not familiar with your business's NAICS code, you can go on to the NAICS code site, or on the various NAICS code sites. There's one linked directly uh, through the application here where you can go in, select your industry, select what you do and it will give you the code that you can type into that space but that space that is we're using that to to um, parse out what industries you're a part of also it's going to ask for other demographic information for your business so it's going to ask if you're a woman-owned business veteran-owned business if you're disabled it's going to ask race and ethnicity questions along with if you're a franchise or minority a minority owned business uh, all those questions are answered here in this business demographic section and then section six, one of the last sections are the disclosures. This is actually what helps generate that other document. This is where you go through and you disclose, uh, is your business open and operating? Yes. Are, are you, is your business organized as a for-profit business? Yes. It's going to take you through a series of questions. Um, it's going to ask you to enter your, your gross receipts again from your tax returns. It's also going to ask if you receive any help or support from a from a Entrepreneurship Assistance Center or a CDFI or Chamber of Commerce or small business development center it's going to ask you if you did that you can put that in you can put who you received who you received support from finally when you've completed all those questions it's going to go to section seven which is your confirmation now you can choose yes or no at this point if you choose if you choose no you can save your application for later not fully submit it if you need to go through and verify some answer or something that you weren't sure about on your previous application questions you can choose no and you can save it without submitting it if you choose yes it's going to let you continue and it's going to let you submit the application for processing once you've hit yes you can't make any changes to those questions so if for some reason you need to correct an error You'll need to contact the 877 number, the, the, the customer service number that's on our website in order to make a modification to your file. Uh, you cannot make modifications yourself uh, to any of the questions you previously answered once you hit uh, yes and continue. You'll receive a confirmation message that you completed your application, that you completed your file. This is, this, this is um, again, has got that 877 number on there that you can use if for some reason uh, you have made a mistake or that you think you've made a mistake in something you're doing, check your check your clutter junk spam all the time for this. Also, there will be that username and password account, uh, password account email that I mentioned earlier. This is gonna come in, your, in that email box that you use to register. And it's gonna give you a username, which is gonna be your email address that you used and a temporary password. If you log on to the site, the actual portal where you upload your documents, um, you can use a temporary password. First thing it's going to do is ask you for a permanent password, but this will let you log in to begin the document upload process. So here we go for uploading documents. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because, again, some of this gets a little technical and it's best viewed while you're in front of your computer to do it. But it is very straightforward. Again, 
to upload your documents, there are four documents that we need for your application to be reviewed and selected to continue processing. That is your applicant certification that you signed, your ID for the person who's applied, and those complete 2019 and 2020 business tax returns. So you're going to want to upload those four documents. You'll see them, the first four listed on the list here with these red asterisks. Those are required for application. We ask that you submit them within 14 days of completing the rest of the application. Um, the sooner, the better. Also, I will point out, you want to make sure that your business uh, type is listed correctly here. This was particularly listed as a corporation. Uh, should pull it directly off of your other app answers. But if for some reason it doesn't come up correctly, you can always change that. Please don't open tabs. Do it all with one tab, of course. In addition, if you have access to these documents or if you're ready to upload them, you can upload your proof of business location, your New York State 45 document, if it's necessary. Again, you don't have to upload the 4506C. As long as you're required by Lendistry, you can always click not applicable until they ask you for it. Uh, once, it's, once they ask you for it, that'll become available. You'll be able to, to upload that document. Um, again, PDFs are the recommended format. We want them in PDF file and PDF style. And it's very straightforward to upload the documents from the port to the portal from your from your desktop or from your smartphone. I'm not going to walk too much through this, but I will also mention that they can still be password protected. If you want to password protect your PDFs, you can do that. You just when you go to upload them securely into the site, it's going to request that you type in the password on the password protection prompt. So that, that way it's going to it's going to securely store the password for the document so they can open it and view it. And once you've gone and uploaded the document, it's going to switch from that orange pending box to the green completed box to show that the document was uploaded. Now, finally, linking your bank information. Uh, like I said, uh, we do use Plaid. The portal does use Plaid to do ACH deposits of your grant funds. And this is going to be very straightforward. Plaid is essentially going to link to your bank account information. And I'm not going to walk too deeply through this. Um, you do not need to do this until you're grant is approved and ready for funding. You don't need to put your bank information in until you've reached that point. Um, I will say that for a sole proprietorship, you do need to have a business bank account. So make sure that you have a business checking account. It's going to match your name or your DBA um, to use it through the portal. So that is the quick walkthrough of the application process. I'm going to turn my camera back on. And uh, again, Application language assistance is available at that 877 number on the screen, 877-721-0097. And of course, all this information with this document is available on mysmallbusinessrecovery.com all the time in all those languages. So I'm not sure if anyone else has any questions. Uh, be happy to try to answer them. Matthew, this is Stacey Dunn. Can I have a quick question? You referenced the sure. New York Forward program. Yes. Um, and, and I'm not sure, you know, the, the geography of how many in, in our region received. We did participate with that program. Um, is that one of those programs where if you did receive a, a loan through New York Forward, does that kick you out of eligibility or can you still? No, no, there are, there are actually, there is no loan that can kick you out of the program aside from pay, right. having a paycheck protection that's too large. Gotcha. So idle loans are acceptable. And the only reason Paycheck Protection Program loans are part of it is because they can be forgiven. Yep. Um, if, if, if they, you know, idle loan or near forward loan fund, those aren't forgivable loans, so they're not part of the process. I'm also going to point out that any grant you receive from any other organization or from any other county or anything else beyond what was mentioned, those are all allowed. Wonderful. So it's only the things that are specifically called out as excluded, like the Restaurant Recovery Fund or Restaurant Revitalization Fund, and paycheck protection programs over 100,000. Those are the only ones you really need to worry about. Right. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat, but I'll give a, a quick shout, as any, shout out. Does anybody have any additional questions or thoughts? Well, Matthew, I want to thank you for taking the time. Again, I think we're, we'll make this recording available. Um, okay. Broadly, and I think uh, it's really helpful the way you walked through this all and, and uh, certainly uh, hopefully we'll get this out to our, our small business community. So thank you again. Terrific. Well, thank, thank you for having you. me. Thanks. Good luck everyone. And you know, please apply soon. 
I want to see as much funding as possible go to upstate New York. So Absolutely. let's <laughs> we do too. get Thank applications you. in. Yes. Thank Have you. a great day. Right. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.